Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's JA Company Program Speaker Series. I'm really excited about our guest tonight. Uh, in a minute, in a moment, you'll meet Roger Lee, and you know my experience with Roger has been. It seems that whenever I go to an event in the city or out, sometimes in Chester County, and the topic is entrepreneurship, is youth education, um, is civic involvement, I seem to always bump into Roger. And so it's really great that we've been able to get him here tonight and explain to us some of those things that are important to him, and especially share why we felt it was important to have his Drexel slash entrepreneur listed as his occupation uh, as he comes here this evening. So a couple of housekeeping items. Again, remember that we will spend about 20 minutes um, hearing from Roger and both his journey and some advice he has to all of you as students in our JA Company program. And then the last 10 minutes, we'll open it up to Q&A, and I'll ask those that have a question to go ahead and, and raise your hand, and then I will call on you accordingly. As always, we are recording this, and it will be posted uh, later this week, and we encourage all of you and our volunteers to share this with other students that are on your teams as well. So with that, Roger, good evening and welcome. Hi, Paul. Good evening. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Well, thank you. And so, Roger, I'm just going to turn it right over to you, and it's always the easy question first. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and then kind of what has brought you here today. Sure. So my name is Roger Lee, born and raised in Philadelphia, and I'm an arts entrepreneur, and I'm also a higher education professional. So I kind of divide my time doing both of those things. And I absolutely love entrepreneurship. I love youth engagement. I love education, civic work as well. So uh, it's just an honor to be here tonight and really, really happy to be connected to you through uh, Dr. Troy Fodell in Downingtown. So it's just a really small world and really, really yes. awesome opportunity. Indeed. So I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. First of all, so tell us a little bit, um, obviously I know a, about your connection with Drexel, but could you talk to our students a little bit about what you do at Drexel and then kind of pivot that into your role as an entrepreneur? Absolutely. So I started out as a Drexel Dragon. Actually, I got my master's degree in arts administration and ended up working at Drexel since 2016. I started out as an adjunct professor at the Charles D. Close School of Entrepreneurship. And for folks who don't know, that's actually the nation's first degree granting school of entrepreneurship. And we're unique in that we're independent from a business school. So we're not a program, we're not a department, but we're our own unique entrepreneurship school. And we give out uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees in entrepreneurship and innovation. So I started out as an adjunct professor teaching undergraduate courses, moved on to graduate, and then became an entrepreneur in residence. But essentially, I was consulting student entrepreneurs on their startup ventures. And they went on to do some amazing, amazing work in that space. And more recently, uh, in the full-time role, I've been our program manager for pre-college and diversity programs. And in that role, I get to work with amazing, amazing high schoolers. They're so entrepreneurial, so socially conscious. So it's just really been great work. Um, but that's by day. And then by night, I'm on my own uh, you know, part-time venture and doing that virtually now. So uh, Roger Lee Arts is a business that really provides three things, motivational speaking, dance company concerts, and artist career success resources. So if you're an artist and you really want to make your artistic passion your living, then I have a bunch of, you know, free resources for you to take. And that's my life. You know, I really do spend a lot of my waking hours focused on, again, education and entrepreneurship. So, you know, what an interesting kind of taking what you're, like you said it, right, your day job, yep. and then turning that into your passion um, and bringing those two pieces together. But I would imagine that when you were in high school and you were thinking about going to Drexel, is that the career path that you had charted before you? Or tell us a little bit about that story. Absolutely. So my life is so different now than I ever imagined it being, especially as a high schooler. So, you know, to be 14 to 18 years old, uh, went to Philadelphia High School for the Creative and Performing Arts. We had some really cool alumni come from there, so Boys to Men, Jasmine Sullivan, and you know, being there was really a one-track mind, I have to say. If you got into Kappa, your goal was to either do Broadway, move to New York and get an agent, or a combination of those two things. So it was either LA or New York. And uh, college, maybe, but not necessarily. And if you did college, it was going to be an art school. And I kind of saw my life going that direction. I really did. I thought, right, I'm going to dance professionally, maybe move to New York, pursue that sort of life. And 
where I'm at now is totally different. Again, I'm still involved in the arts, but to be involved with higher education is really, really, really different than what I imagined. Again, I didn't even know if I would go to college, let alone become a college professor. So sometimes life will definitely trick you into a totally different path than you imagined for yourself. And as you think, do, do you think there's kind of one uh, specific skill that you think is most important as you kind of have, you know, kind of entrepreneurship at the center of, of what you do, again, both with your professional life and your personal life? Like, what's that one secret sauce that you think has helped you do that? Well, that's a really good question, Paul. For me, it's uh, flexibility, right? Having to be extremely nimble. Um, you just have to be ready to move and to shake, you know, where life asks you to move and shake. So again, it could be dance for the moment, right? It might be higher ed, but you really need to be able to adjust. Uh, COVID has kind of taught all of us that that hard lesson, I believe. Um, I think a lot of people are saying, wow, like the world's changing, things are different, industries are folding, new industries are opening. Right, this tech space is booming now, so I think everybody is uh, becoming more flexible, some by force. But I'll say that I've always been really flexible throughout my career, and I think it's kind of allowed me to try different things out, uh, different than my, you know, art, artistic peers, but totally different from my collegiate peers as well. So. So you mentioned COVID and that flexibility, and and you know that's kind of what brings us here tonight, right? Is that um, we wanted to provide opportunities for the students in our program to kind of build their network, you know, which normally would happen in person through JA events, and and and, and that kind of was the the genesis of, uh, genesis of this. So from that perspective, so now you know, put on your entrepreneur hat now. So. You know, you mentioned, you know, what if I understood correctly, you know, motivational speaker and then opportunities through dance, which I, I, explain that to me a little like, how, you know, are you doing that in person? Or are you doing that in vir virtually? And talk a little bit about that pivot. Sure. So it was a major pivot for me. Uh, the nature of my work has always been very much in person. Right. So starting out as a dancer, I learned early on this about events and connecting with people in person and all of that. So, uh, you know, we started in 2012. We had 15 live shows under our belt, 300 people at the show. You know, news media coverage, it was all about in person. COVID happened and I had to make a really hard choice. I remember we were two weeks out from opening our 16th show and we had tickets sold and the show was done and we were ready to rock and roll for Tech Week. And, you know, just looking at the news and this virus is kind of picking up speed and I had to really make a hard choice. And I decided to pull the show. Now I remember the venue said, you know, we can still do this and we'll have hand sanitizer and you'll be fine. But something to me was like, this is moving a little bit too rapidly and I'm going to pivot early. And I just thank God I did that because it saved me a lot of money and heartache, you know, if I had to roll that way for two more weeks. Um, but all that to say, you know, you either have to pivot or you have to pause. And I don't judge people who paused and I don't judge people who pivoted at all. But for me, it was uh, really important to keep going even if I had to go online. So what I did was a, a whole virtual production instead. And I started from scratch and I had to recast and find dancers who wanted to dance online. Uh, my whole entire cast said, you know, we love you and we love your work, but you know, we can't dance in person. We don't want to dance from home. So I had to completely, when we say pivot, <laughs> it was like really starting from scratch, but keeping that dream and vision alive was really uh, what kept me going. Same thing with motivational speaking, you know, I've had the honor and privilege to really talk with more people now virtually than I was getting to do in person. So, you know, I did the TED Talk years ago and, you know, maybe a few times a year would go to an event and get to speak. But now, you know, every month I can talk to like two or three awesome groups like yours. So I really think within the pivot, you find out, wow, things can uh, be different, but even more impactful than you imagined. So Roger, so much of what you do, both as a professor and then as an entrepreneur is building trust, right? And, but, you know, I know, and I can imagine you even more so, how hard that is to do in a virtual environment. And when I think of where our students are in their programs as they're starting to pivot from, you know, they've got this great idea, they've, in many cases, they pitched it to their, their, their board of directors virtually, but now they have to kind of take that idea out to market. And a lot of that is going to involve um, the small groups kind of breaking out and making sure that each of those pieces is taken care of. So tell us from your experience, how, you know, how do you build that trust? How do you build that team? When you were uh, uh, assembling your ensembles um, or, or the, the, the um, people in your production, how did you build that camaraderie? In some cases, I would imagine you may not have even have met some of these people in person before. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that's hard. Like you said, you know, you're looking at reels footage, resumes, and all of that. 
And those things are great, right? They kind of say what a person can do, but they never tell you what that person will do, right? So <laughs> I learned the hard way, yeah, <laughs> even before COVID, right? Just doing auditions saying, wow, brilliant dancer, brilliant artist, and then they just weren't part of the team, right? They weren't really a team player. So sometimes you learn it the hard way. I think with this uh, COVID environment that we're in, to build trust, you have to really enhance your communication. And a lot of people think that communication only means more Zoom calls. <laughs> and I know this, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, people think, all right, communicate more, hop on the Zoom. And that's not always the case. You know, it can be done over a text. It can be done on a phone call. But really, communication is key, being transparent about policies and procedures, about the vision, right? Because that can get lost in the sauce. If you're not face-to-face -face and you can't read body language and you can't hug and shake hands and all those things, sometimes the communication is lost. And sometimes people don't understand what it is that we're trying to do collectively. So it's really, really important, I think, especially for leaders who are, you know, leading teams online nowadays, you can't overestimate how important it is to say, my mission is, our mission is, this is why you matter, this is why your job matters. Because uh, people need that inspiration from home. You know, we're all going through our own things and uh, people need that kind of inspiration and to know that their work is authentic and that it means something. So we can't rest on our laurels like we used to and say, oh, well, it's in the employee handbook or it's in the manual. and. People know why we're here. Like read our mission statement online and you, know, you have to communicate this stuff over and over to your team. I think when it comes to building trust with clients and customers, it's even more important to be transparent. So again, how does the trail, you know, sales cycle look? What's the sequence of events? What's the trailing look like? Um, where's your money going? Or if you're donating, like how is that money spent? So authenticity and communication are really, really important in this virtual space because we also know there's cancel culture, right? We know that nowadays it's just a thing so uh yeah you don't want to make the mistake of people not trusting you and your brand so be as authentic as possible almost overly to the point of annoyance and you think wow am i saying too much or <laughs> am i explaining too much but i don't think you can nowadays so <laughs> i've got like eight <laughs> questions but i'll pick one so, so within all that you know i heard you talk about making sure you can you know you communicate explicitly I heard you use the word lost, right? And, and and that your message doesn't get lost, your brand doesn't get lost. But some of that is, as a leader, how do you make sure your team doesn't get lost? So are, is there anything you can share how you make sure that everyone feels that their voice is heard during mm -hmm. all of that noise that you just described? Yeah, absolutely. That's when we have our meetings, right? There's a certain way I like to facilitate. Uh, we go over an agenda first and foremost, but then we really do open the floor and we don't just jump into business or unless they open the floor it's more about introducing yourself if there are new people in that meeting because um, you you probably know this in your line of work right but sometimes we hop into the zoom call and we assume that oh and you must have looked me up online or you know who i am or i know who you are and no it's important for every call you know take that introduction time ask people how they're doing are you guys healthy are you feeling well is your family okay right don't lose that human element by doing that it already sets the ground for a trusting environment once you've done that then you really need to take the time to follow the agenda and make sure that people have a voice. Call on folks, ask them if they have any questions, ask them if they have comments, and especially if they have concerns. That's really where you get the most participation on these calls. You know, you can ask for questions all day long, but if you say, well, any concerns, any issues, all the hands go up instantly, right? <laughs> so, um, but listening to, you know, that feedback too is so important. So not just doing it for lip service and checking it off and saying, all right, well, we have some concerns and we'll put them away on our hard drive. You know, you kind of have to come back and say, as a leader, I tried to implement the feedback you gave me in the following ways. And you won't be able to please everybody, right? But if you could come in and say, at least I did 50% of what was requested or commented upon. And I think the trust is there, the rapport is there, the teamwork is there. But uh, again, this is in a magical environment, right? <laughs> These are the best practices, but uh, we know sometimes life happens and things fall through the cracks. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I think, you know, that's the, you know, and you and I were even kind of joking about this before we started, right, is is with all that, it's it's so important. And yet it's so hard right now because everything seems to blur together. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a leader, um, can you share just a little bit? Um, what do you do to take care of yourself, right? I mean, what do you do, you know, so much of what you do as a leader to make sure you're taking care of those around you? But is there anything you could share relative to making sure you is, is the leader is okay? Absolutely. And just before that, I want to say thank you for even acknowledging the importance of self-care. Uh, so many people forget that and they think, like you said, the leadership is just about taking care of others. But 
think you and I both share this value and this belief that uh, if you're not good first, you can't be good to other people. You know, you have to take care of yourself first. So I love that you're thinking that way. And uh, I do a lot of things for self-care, for sure. I always pray. I want to get up in the morning. I always work out. Um, that's something I've been doing a lot more of now that the gyms are closed. I'm like, all right, I can't go to the studio. I can't go to the gym. And I'm getting older, like we all are. So like, I need to you know, maintain. And I'm sitting on Zoom all day. So I have to definitely do more working out than I used to do. But that makes me feel good in the morning, you know, and it um, starts my metabolism. I feel a lot healthier, a lot happier, ready to start my day. So by the time I hop on the calls, I'm just like adrenaline running, you know, feeling really, really excited for what's ahead. Um, outside of the praying and working out, also just take time to read and not just read stuff for school, right? Not just reading papers and books, but reading the things I want to do, you know, it could be a, a magazine. It doesn't matter. Just something I want to read. Also uh, watching TV and being fine with that. I think sometimes in academia and entrepreneurship, it's like this myth that you just grind all day and night and you never just veg out. And everybody knows me well and knows like I'm definitely an advocate for vegging out. We need to, you know, we're doing heavy, heavy brain work here. So yeah, I'll just watch a silly show, right? I'll watch music videos. I just don't have a problem having fun. I say you have to work really hard, but you have to play harder just to stay motivated, right? To stay inspired and energetic so that you can be there for your team. Because nobody wants to follow somebody who's like feeling, you know, uh, we're here again. It's just another day, like, you know, feeling uninspired. Um, but for me to inspire somebody else, I need to feel inspired first, you know. Oh, that is a great point. So pivoting kind of, so think inspiration, uh, you know, uh, knowing what, you know, both from a Drexel perspective and then an individual perspective, um, a key component of the of the J Company program is giving back to the community. Um, all of our um, enterprises here, the students will make a decision on who they want to donate their proceeds proceeds to um, in the community, a portion of those proceeds. So tell us a little bit about why you think that's important. Um, I, you know, I know how involved Drexel is in the community and particularly from, an, you know, the, 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 the close school of entrepreneurship in terms of support to local businesses. But why is that even important and, and how can you kind of, again, align your company's passion, hopefully with yours as well? Absolutely. So I definitely start with Drexel for this. Um, you know, we want to be like the most typically engaged university and we're doing that. And I think it's very important to do that because we reside within a rich community, a historical community. Um, we're deep in West Philadelphia. So it's really important to acknowledge those roots and honor them and to say, hey, we're taking up space here in the place that as again, their own history, their own culture, their own customs. So, you know, you kind of do have that moral obligation, I believe, to give back to that community and to serve them well. So it's very important to do that. And I hope that that does inspire the student entrepreneurs who are here tonight to think again, where do I take up space? And maybe it's virtual space, maybe it's physical space, right? But where are you residing? Who are the folks around you? And what can you do to kind of contribute to the culture and the community? And I think as entrepreneurs, as business owners, sometimes we just think about us, ourselves all the time. And we just work in the vacuum, right? So it's about company culture, but what about the community culture? What about the neighborhood, the city, the state that you represent? So I always encourage young entrepreneurs to think, where do I live? What are the issues here? And what can I personally do or what can my company do to help solve or make those issues a little less intense? And I try to practice what I preach and I do that through Roger Lee Arts. Um, you know, we work with K-12 schools a lot. And then outside of that, you know, I'm on a lot of advisory boards and working with down the town and uh, different things like that. So it is important just to find that time to give back. I tell people you can give back in many ways. It's not just about writing a, a check or right? you can donate money, but you can also donate time or your expertise, your services. People love that. So, again, if you're doing advisory board work or being on the grants panel or judging entrepreneurship competition, like all those things matter. And that can go beyond just writing a check, you know, not engaging. I um, also think it's really important to become advocates, right? Find the cause, find two causes, maybe even three that you care a lot about and figure out a way to use your platform to speak about that cause. And for our students here tonight, I know it can be social media for you guys. All of you are viral, right? So many of the students I work with, they all have like 10,000 followers a piece. So it's pretty huge, you know? And I think they think that's small, but I'm like in our world, right? Me and you know, that's huge. So it's uh, really important for them to take advantage of their area and say, hey, what can I do to get a word out, to speak about awesome causes and make the community I serve a lot better? 
I was going to put a plug in there for if any of those students that have 10,000 followers uh, want to give some time back to a local entrepreneurship nonprofit, I have yeah. someone in mind they could support. So, you know, send them our way. Mm -hmm. So, hey, I'm going to give everybody a heads up that we're going to open it up for Q&A &A here in about one minute. So, Roger, last question. Go back in time. The one thing that you wish you knew in high school or about business or entrepreneurship that maybe would have made you think a little bit differently as you, you know, kind of went forward in life. The, the one thing you wish you knew that you know now. Mm, that's such a good question. I wish I knew that there was an audience for everybody. I'm not saying audience, you know, from my, my arts background, but it could be a client, a customer, however you want to put that. But there's really somebody for everybody. And when I was in high school, I did not think that, and maybe it was because, again, I was in a very competitive school in a competitive space. And, you know, you were kind of taught that uh, you don't book the gig. That's it, right? You either switch professions or you move cities. But uh, but that's not true. That was a myth. And it definitely was a myth that stifled me throughout most of my 20s. It really wasn't until I was about 29 to 30. And I said, all right, there's more out here, right? There's a different path. There's always somebody. There's, there are niche audiences out there. And you might have to work really hard to dig up those audiences, but they're out there. So if you're not like in the mainstream, quote unquote, or uh, finding the popular audience, find another one because somebody needs what you provide. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and ask, do we have any questions for Roger tonight? Okay, Jacob, I see your hand up. Go ahead and get off mute and turn on your video, please. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Roger, for speaking tonight. I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I just had a quick question because um, you said you were a professor for entrepreneurship in college. And I was just wondering, um, for someone who wants to be an entrepreneur, like how important is college education? Like how much value does that provide to entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. Great question. Nice to meet you, Jacob. Thanks for being here and asking that. Wow, that's the, really the <laughs> age-old question here, right? Do I need college to be an entrepreneur? I would recommend it. Or I can't say if you need it or not, but I would recommend it for sure. I think that college does a lot for an entrepreneur. I think it teaches you critical thinking. It teaches you strategic planning. It teaches you how to be nimble. Like Paul and I were talking about earlier, how to be flexible. Right? We take you guys through simulations on how to do those things. So it's more about life skills, at least from my perspective. And, you know, when you study entrepreneurship in college, it's definitely about creativity, innovation. How do you thrive and build a living or an enterprise in the 21st century? And that's totally different than, you know, your peers who might be studying uh, French or either mathematics. Like every major has its own focus. But that's what I love about entrepreneurship. It really is about preparing you to be a thriving adult. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? And again, I'll remind, go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, we'll say, though, I wish I studied entrepreneurship in college. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> well, and, and, and I think what's interesting is, is it, you know, and I would imagine, Roger, you see this as, you know, kind of those two paths, right? Those, you know, who, who have a venture, right, that they want to start. They have that idea. You know, I, I remember I used to joke when I, when I would go in and teach JA classes, you know, somebody came up with the idea for a pudding pop, you know, yeah. um, or a cake pop, you know, something that doesn't sound like it's revolutionary. And boy, don't you wish you had your name on that. Mm -hmm. But the flip side is, is that how important entrepreneurial thinking is. And this is what we hear from a lot of employers we work with in, in the community. The idea that how do you bring value? How do you work with others? How do you take, you know, appropriate risk? Um, how do you make decisions? All of those things are so valuable in today's workforce, whether you're going to work right out of high school, you're going to college, um, you know, and or starting your own enterprise. So, um, you know, entrepreneurship, I think, is, is something that means so many different things to so many different people, and yet it's such a valuable skill, no matter what you think your future holds. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. I love how you hit the nail on the head, too, about uh, the differences, right? Because so many people think it's just a practice, mm -hmm. right? Creating a uh, revenue, but it's beyond that. At least the Drexel, right? We see it as a uh, twofold. It's mindset and practice. Yes. We spend a lot of time in the mindset first, and then you go into practice. But that mindset takes you anywhere. Like you said, whether you practice or not, having an entrepreneurial mindset will set you apart. 
And if you do end up getting a job, you could become an entrepreneur and create your own position or departments, initiatives. I mean, how marketable is that, right? No, absolutely. So, well, we're going to make last call for any questions here. Going once, going twice. Otherwise, I will thank Roger for participating. You know, this we will get this out um, and uh you know, we will have students that will use it, you know, you know, I always get it backwards, but in a asynchronous fashion. Um, and then we'll push it out to um, all of the um, volunteers in our program as well. So, Roger, any last words of wisdom for us? Well, definitely. I'll say uh, to all these students here and the students who aren't here right now, uh, students who listen to this later on, don't forget that life happens. And I kind of said that earlier, but I didn't get to expound upon that, right? life happens um 2020 happened COVID happened right things are going to happen that are not in your control but you do have the power to move beyond that so i promise you this won't last forever we won't always need a mask right we won't always be stuck at home one day things will be a lot better than they are now and you're going to want to take this time where you're kind of at home and doing things differently to plan for your future or you don't want to just wake up and things are back to normal or what we call the new normal and then you're not prepared Right, take this time to really figure out who you are as a person, who you want to be as a student, an entrepreneur, and do everything in your power to get ready so that when things do open back up, you're just ready to go out the gate and really make things happen. And I think there are going to be two types of students or two types of people, right? The ones, again, who only did Netflix the whole time <laughs> and the ones who did some Netflix and some strategy work as well. So hopefully you're in the ladder, you know, and you're ready to really make your dreams happen when the time is right. But please don't think that this is forever because it's not. You know, my experience with this group is they're in the ladder. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, Roger, we look, thank you again for participating. Uh, this is your second time doing an event with Junior Achievement, and I've already got ideas for that third and fourth time. So, you know, okay. I'll be in touch. So, thank you, Ian. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for this. Okay. Everyone have a good evening, and I will see you all again next week. Good night.